Hello, BookTube. Right, we're going to continue with this library tour, even though it's the weekend, uh, because we're never going to finish. <laughs> so we might as well keep going. And this next shelf that we're going to do uh, has a lot of caulking. <laughs> there are, it's a lot of caulking to start with. Those of you who may not be familiar with the technical terms that we use in the book collecting world, caulking is when you, la you stack books laterally on top of themselves. Uh, it's bad for them. It's bad for the books that you inevitably stack them on top of, who are, st who are stacked right. Uh, it's bad for everybody. <laughs> Cocking is bad for everybody. Something we knew in the early 1970s, but didn't quite have the word for. <laughs> uh, so we'll do with the, with the cocked books first. Uh, the first one is an Oxford World Classic we've seen already. This is uh, Eric the Red and other Icelandic sagas. This is an old Oxford World Classic of, uh, of great Icelandic sagas. In a new a newer translation by Gwyn Jones, uh, I have enjoyed this. There's no reason at all for me to keep it, but I have enjoyed it. Uh, this next one is tiny. Oh, all right. This is Frances Hodgson Burnett's My Robin, a uh, tiny little uh, book that she wrote about a robin in her garden. I wonder if there's there's a color picture here. I believe uh, this is just a minuscule little thing. I wrote about it. I I discovered it, of course, at the Brattle Bookshop and loved it. Uh, and then uh, this next one was also a kid's book. This is by Robert Lemon and Don Eckleberry. And I found this, I believe, in uh, in Vermont. Uh, and I got it for the Eckleberry illustrations. Uh, I believe they're his. Uh, yeah, uh, they're, uh, this is The Birds Are Yours. They are not, <laughs> in fact, yours. But this is meant in the sense of they're, they are yours to understand. They're, they're your hobby. Uh, and this is just filled with fantastic illustrations. Just there's a bird pretending to be injured. Uh, it's just filled with them. Let me find you another one. Uh, there's a woodpecker. Uh, so, so I kept it, even though I don't. I need another bird book. Like I need another hole in the head. I kept it anyway. Uh, then this next one is uh, a, a modern library, the early modern library. I confess, I found it at the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston, and I got it even though I didn't particularly need it. And has since it has since become my favorite edition of this author. This is the Poems of Longfellow, with a fantastic vintage New England in winter cover illustration. I just love that the, the cover illustrations for a long era of these modern library mass market size hardcovers were all wonderful. The Henry James ones are works of art, and this one is too. Uh, and I am a big fan of Longfellow, uh, so I shouldn't I shouldn't have this just cocked here willy-nilly. <laughs> I should have it in a place of its own. But the temptation with little books, with little hardcovers or little paperbacks, is to cock them. It's to stick them in all the random places where the big hardcovers won't fit. And I have succumbed <laughs> to that temptation. Uh, Okay, this next one is a, a, it's a penguin, a pelican book. Uh, no reason at all for me to have it, except that I like the look of it. I have the penguin edition of this, and I have a couple of others, and also I have the unabridged. This is the uh, pelican one-volume gibbon. Uh, this is... Um, it doesn't even... Look at that. It doesn't even tell you on the cover. The cover says a pelican book... One volume abridgment by D.M. Lowe, 944 pages. You have to read the marble to know what the title is. It's only the print up there. The print, the subtitle is up at the top. Uh, but I have, I have uh, two or three other one volume abridgments of Gibbon, and I also have the the complete um, Penguin Classic, the the three big fat uh, trade paperbacks. So I don't need that. <laughs> I don't need that at all. Uh, Oh, okay. All right. Well, this is a fairly modern book. I wonder if this still has... A, yeah, this still has a pub sheet in it. Uh, this is from... Uh, pretty sure before we knew each other. No, no. This is from March of 2017. I was making videos full, steel in, full steam in March of 2017. This is uh, Thoreau's Animals. Um, also illustrated. Just... Uh, 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 the, uh, the author goes through um, Thoreau's journals. Finds everything animal-related and then just... Uh, excerpts it. it. There's another volume, I think, for Thoreau's Wildflowers or Thoreau's Trees or something like that, but Thoreau's Animals was one that I had to have. Uh, <laughs> okay, then this next thing's not a book. It's a clear plastic cover for a keyboard, for a laptop keyboard. I have, I, I'm, I have dozens of these things scattered all over Hyde Cottage from when I used to buy them. I used to buy them all the time. Every time I got a new laptop, I would get pla a plastic cover for the top, a plastic cover for the bottom, and a clear plastic cover for the keyboard. 
And I did that under the assumption that I was horribly hard on my machines, that they would break or scratch or chip otherwise, and that I needed one of these things for the keyboard because I was sloppy about the keyboard, had tons of dog hair drifting all around, and was also hard on the keyboard. I learned how to type on a manual typewriter uh, and typed that way for decades and just assumed that I would pound the hell out of any, te any computer co keyboard that I had, and this, this mitigates the, the damages of that. And then two or three years ago, I just suddenly realized, you know, <laughs> that's a good way to get old, and you don't want to get old. <laughs> you must remember, in all in all cases, at all times, that everything about you is plastic. You weren't born doing any of the things you're doing now. You learned how to do them all, you, and you can unlearn how to do them all. So I thought to myself, okay, well, instead of getting all these things that reduce, that, that make your your machine heavier and clunkier, and that also reduce the sightline beauty. Uh, there is a minimalistic kind of space age beauty to a MacBook product, for instance. Instead of doing that, why don't you learn, why don't you teach yourself to be more delicate with your electronics and also, more importantly, to type more gently? To, to type in the way that you have seen tutorials on the, the all the YouTube videos of people, their fingers are whispering over the keyboards. And for years, I used to make a joke out of that with friends of mine. I used to say, well, my fingers aren't going to whisper over the keyboard, so I need to protect it somehow. And then I thought, okay, what's the given in that situation? It's your, the, the thing you're assuming is that you cannot change the way you type. Of course you can. So I did. <laughs> now I don't need these things anymore. I not only don't need them to protect the keyboard, but I also don't need them to protect the inside of the machine because Frida doesn't shed. And so my dog for, for you know, fingers crossed, the next 16 years does not shed. So... So I got rid of them. I got I, all my all of my Mac products. I have uh, two MacBook Pros and a MacBook Air, and they are completely naked <laughs> to the world. They are, they do not have uh, cases. They do not have coverings. They do not have skins. They do not have keyboard coverings. They don't have anything like that. And there's nothing wrong with them at all. So, uh, but anyway, that's not a book. So let's uh, let's press on here. We know we're done with caulking now. Uh, okay. All right. This is. All right, this is a guide to Venice. Um, I've, you've seen in the course of this laboratory innumerable books about Venice. This is an odd one. This is John Kent's uh, Color Guide to the City. Some of you may remember these these uh, travel guides. They take you block by block, street by street, building by building. So it is it is an information, a graphic heavy version of the older 19th century versions of, of doing the same thing that we've seen already on this library tour that take you just street by street in Venice. So you know exactly where you are at all times. All of these things predated the kind of live action apps, navigation apps, tourist apps that you can get now. You can download them for free. You can upgrade them. You know, $7 will get you an app that'll, that will be would have been a miracle to any traveler before the present day, where it not only locates you exactly where you are using GPS, but also updates to the minute on all of the opening times, construction, street blockages uh, in Venice, uh, high water, or flooding, and also renders it all to you in, in spoken voice. So that you can, you can if, you, if you enable the audio feature, <laughs> the, the resources available to travelers now are just mind-boggling. But once upon a time, you had to do with something like this. And the benefit of something of, of this kind of a book is that it's very simple and very colorful and visual. Uh, it's it's me it's not meant to give you any of the history. It's meant to just tell you where you are. <laughs> uh, so what is this next one? Oh, okay. All right, this is another uh, another sweet subject of mine, a sweet spot subject of mine. We've seen it many times in many different versions throughout. They're not noticed altogether. They're not altogether at all. That's terrible. This is. Um, uh, by Robin Fedden and John Kenworthy Brown, and it is the Country House Guide. It's a guide to the country houses of the United Kingdom, uh, and it's 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 heavier. It's it's uh, I don't think it's meant to be packed in your backpack, and it takes you gives you uh, black and white photos, but also uh, lots of color photos of the outside and inside of all of these palatial country houses, and. Uh, I find them fascinating, <laughs> absolutely fascinating. I've spent a lot of time in, in quite a few of them um, and have visited all the others. And, and just, and of course, <laughs> since we're on BookTube, I've also read a huge amount, a totally unhealthy amount of mystery novels set in English country houses. So, so I've, got it, I've got it coming both ways. I just find the subject fascinating, that's all. Uh, what is this next one? Oh, 
Oh my. Oh my. Okay, uh, this is uh, Robert Lawrence's uh, Park Street in its vicinity. You can't see the floppy, the floppy uh, bookmark. Park Street and its vicinity. Th those of you who maybe who maybe haven't done me the favor of visiting me here in Boston, <laughs> Park, Park Street is uh, Park Street and its vicinity. There we go. And here we have a very old picture of Park Street Church. That area does not look like that anymore, <laughs> but uh, uh, but it's a it's a uh, central node in what one wise old man referred to as the hub of the universe. Uh, it used to be that I passed that very street, this this very corner. It didn't look like this for most of the years when I passed it. It didn't look like this, but it, uh, it used to be that I passed this corner literally every single day, uh, and that was for decades that I did that every single day of my life past that corner. I know every brick of it. I know every street, every building. I know every change in every building. I know all the details. Uh, and this is the, this is this kind of a biography of that one little corner. <laughs> it's just delightful. Uh, all right, so what do we got? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. All right, what comes next is an extreme rarity in my library, and especially in this little book room. It's an extreme rarity. This is, what comes next is organized. <laughs> completely organized. Oh my. So I don't know how this probably won't take us very long to do. What what comes next is Rumpole. <laughs> John Mortimer's immortal creation, Rumpole of the Bailey. An old Bailey hack who works at number three equity court and, and survives uh, on the rich pickings of the legal aid system. <laughs> he's a he's a, a battered old Bailey hack barrister who never pleads guilty and who often deals in very, very petty crime. <laughs> and these books are wonderful, absolutely wonderful. They are very much in the nature of Woodhousean comedy rather than in the nature of a serial mystery, mystery novels. I mean, they were in your mystery section and there was a new Rumpel novel every year and that sort of thing, but they were much, they were much more, the point of them was much more the atmospheric comedy. Uh, and I love them, absolutely love them. I also love the, uh, the BBC production starring Leo McKern, the great, the late great Leo McKern, was the the Rumpole. <laughs> uh, so we have, uh, I believe, uh, Mark Richardson could tell me better. I believe this is a Folio Society. Uh, I can't believe I have to open it to find out. Yeah, this is a Folio Society of Rumpole. Uh, and once again, I'm having trouble putting it back in its box. <laughs> this is this is the Folio Society. Rumpole that has uh, an illustrated front cover, there is our hero, and an illustrated back cover, there is his wig, and a bottle, a bottle of Chateau Thames Embankment, of Pomeroy's Very Ordinary. <laughs> uh, I have the, uh, I don't know how Mark does these things, I really don't. Uh, I have the Folio Society, That's, it's a selection of Rumpole, selection of the of the short stories uh, then we have a collection of short stories this was this is Rumpole a la carte with one of the, the uh, for a little while the Rumpole productions came with these beautiful cover illustrations look at that cover illustration that is just incredible actually do we find out who do we know who does that uh, the, this illustration is by Christopher Green and it it just could not be any nicer uh, and the same thing is true with this one Rumpole on trial which has there is the wig, and there is a Chateau Thames and Penguin. There is a um, a bit of legal work that will hand, be handed to Rumpole by his clerk. <laughs> uh, and Rumpole on trial has these all. These all have just fantastic stories in them. Rumpole on trial, of course, the the title story is a, an instance where a sniveling colleague of Rumpole believes that he has broken a judge's law, a judge's edict on a case, and and wants, wants him drummed out of the service. <laughs> and Rumpole at first refuses to comply, uh, refuses even to defend himself. And same thing with Rumpole a la carte. The title of Rumpole a la carte is a, is a case in which Rumpole defends an arrogant uh, artiste chef named Jean-Pierre O'Higgins. <laughs> uh, these are fantastic. I do believe these are the only two that I have with these covers. Uh, then we move on. This was uh, Viking book from years and years ago. Uh, this is probably 10 years old now, right? Let's see. Uh, 2011. So very nearly 10 years old. This is Forever Rumpole, uh, a collection of Rumpole short stories, uh, posthumous collection that, uh, that uh, 
I pitched it to an editor. I was, I was thinking, you know, Rumpel is he's a tough thing to explain. I would be really entertaining writing about him, but you know, you can't you can't promise that to an editor. You have to they have to understand what you're pitching them. And my editor turned out was an expat Brit who was who jumped over himself to say yes, absolutely right about this book. So I did. Uh, if I remember, I will leave a link. Uh, okay, then we have uh, this was a, a Penguin Modern Classics. I got this I think from uh, Book Depository. Uh, and this is uh, the collected stories of Rumpole, but this is not, of course, the collected stories of Rump. The collected stories of Rumpole would take many books to do. I believe this is the paperback version of Forever Rumpole. I believe these are the exact same table of contents. Uh, but I nevertheless read this all over again. Plus, I love the uh, the cover illustration; just think it's fantastic. Uh, then, oh, okay, all right. This is this is another uh, Christopher Green illustration. This is the Trials of Rumpole, which is the very first. Uh, this, or, no, the first one I think is Rumpole of the Bailey. And then you have the Trials of Rumpole. I think uh, that, well, actually, let's see. I wonder if they listed here. Yeah, Rumpole of the Bailey is the first one. Then the Trials of Rumpole. Uh, the Trials of Rumpole, I'm sure, will include some immortal stories. Just the stories that you just, I couldn't live without. Uh, yes, Rumpole and the Man of God. Rumpole and the Age of Retirement, which is the one that the store that the whole collection ends with, where Rumpole allows his his colleagues at Number Three Equity Court to believe that he might be retiring. <laughs> uh, and you know this, there's the Oxford Book of English Verse, the Quiller Cooch edition. <laughs> uh, th this volume with the uh, with the Christopher Green illustrations on it from Penguin makes me wonder. Every time I see this on my shelf, I wonder. Did all, did Christopher Green do the illustrations for all of the volumes of Rumpole, and I've just never seen them? How nice that would be to find all of those. <laughs> that would be very nice. Uh, and then, to, to round this out, we have uh, these beautiful um, modern, uh, relatively more modern, uh, hardcover novels that, that John Mortimer just started doing a full-length novel, a Rumpole novel every year instead of short stories. So we have, uh, and they all have these great, again, great cover illustrations. Who does the cover illustration this time? Uh, Daniel Adel, A-D-E-L. Uh, so we have uh, Rumpole in the Reign of Terror. Uh, Rumpole rests his case. Don't you believe it? <laughs> we have uh, Rumpole misbehaves. He gets himself a, a misbehaving uh, write-up. <laughs> uh, Rumpel and the Penge Bungalow Murders. This is, notice the, our, our hero is much skinnier and has dark hair under his, <laughs> under his, uh, his wig. Because this is finally, Mortimer decided, rather than make this the giant rat of Sumatra, right, rather than make this a case that no one knows anything about, he should write it himself. This is this is the case that made Rumpole's career. It got him his entry in the legal who's who, the notable British trials, in which he uh, he brought home a conviction alone and without a leader at the very beginning of his career. And we hear about it all the time in earlier Rumpole stories. But we never have any of the details. This is the detail. This is the story of the Penge Bungalow murders. Uh, and uh, Rumpole and the Primrose Path. And you notice these are all in this in just beautiful uniform hardcovers with with this thing right here. Jason would know the name of it. Whatever the shiny thing is here, uh, at the edge of the banner of each one of them, just wonderful, just wonderful. Uh, and I was uh, initially skeptical, of course, because you know Rumpel is to me quintessentially a short story creation. But the novels are, are fantastic. I love them. Um, so there you go. That is. Uh, that is this shelf. That was not all that hard. <laughs> it's mostly Rumpel. <laughs> uh, and of course, doing that is tempting me to pull down one of those things to, to maybe take Rumpel Rest's Case or a collection of short stories and start rereading them. And I must not do that. <laughs> I must not do that. I have lots of stuff to, do, to read. <laughs> I must not do that. That's the, the endemic danger of these library tours, especially in this little room. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this this up for now, uh, but we have other bookish stuff to talk about, uh, and I'll just keep doing these library tours every time I get a chance. So I will I will wrap this up, but I will see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.